Sports Talk Chicago. Here for Johnson Glula, and we are back and ready for today's special guest. He's the host of Kaplan and Crew, the Mightier 1090, Sedona and Camp, and ESPN 710, and the founder of Saturday Debates. Please welcome Scott Kaplan to the program. Scott, great to have you on. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. This is really cool. Scott, do you buy the Chargers at 4-1? Um, look, I I buy that the Chargers are four and one because I've seen it with my own eyes. They have achieved a four and one record through the first five weeks of the season. They've had some really good wins uh, to go on the road and beat the Chiefs in Kansas City looked really good a few weeks ago. And the Chiefs don't really look as strong as they have the previous two years. So uh, it's a good win because it's a division win on the road. But we all thought it was a great win a few weeks ago. Now, on the other hand, this past weekend. Uh, in front of half the crowd was Cleveland Browns fans and half the fans were Charger fans. Uh, the Chargers put on an incredible show offensively, especially in the fourth quarter. And let's face it, the Browns, uh, you know, they had an opportunity. They tried to run the clock with three and a half minutes to go and they went three and out and they gave the ball right back to the Chargers at midfield and the Chargers scored one. Yes, the Chargers are form one. The Chargers are good. The Chargers are exciting. In my history with the Chargers, I'm expecting it to all fall apart at some point. I'm figuring everybody's going to wind up getting hurt. You know, that's usually what happens. And if it doesn't happen like that, it'll, it'll be some other catastrophe. Although I will just say one last thing, which is this is a different coach. I, I, I acknowledge that. And I admit that this is a young coach who's got nothing to lose and he's just throwing the dice and he's a gambler, this guy. So uh, they're good and they're exciting but it doesn't change the fact that I'm still a very salty San Diego guy who does not like the fact that they moved out of town. When you heard about that news that they'd be moving, what was your reaction? Well, my first reaction, and I remember it quite vividly, was disbelief because when it was actually announced, uh, the NFL Network called me, and I immediately jumped on the NFL Network and was talking to them, and I was saying, I still don't believe it. I mean, like, they've announced it, but I still don't believe it. And the reason for that, just by the way, is because I was so involved with trying to help keep the Chargers in San Diego. I was trying to rally the fan base to vote for it. Uh, I was connecting Charger executives with local political executives. And really, why is a sports radio host doing that? And the reason was is because I wanted the Chargers to stay. And I always felt like, you know, radio is not just about jumping on the air and talking smack. It was really about being a community leader. And, um, and using the airwaves for something bigger than just yourself. And I tried, and, and a very quick story, which is, it was about Christmas Eve uh, in 2016, the Chargers were playing the Raiders. And at that time, you know, there was so much talk about the Chargers and the Raiders both moving. And I was on the sideline of that game for CBS, and Dean Spanos, the owner of the Chargers, walked up to me. He extended his hand to shake my hand, which I thought was unusual. And he said, because um, when we have a relationship, but not close, and he said, hey, I want to thank you. He put his hand on I want to thank you. I said, for what? He said, you really did everything you could do to try and help us. And, and I think that's really great. And I said, well, thank you, man. I, you know, I just want the team to stay. And he goes, well, had we gotten 50% of the vote, this is a little more detail. He goes, but if we'd gotten 50% of the vote, we would have stayed and fought and tried. And I went, hold on. You're speaking in the past tense. Have you made your decision? And he said, well, we're now leaning towards moving to L.A. So I immediately contact the CBS truck and my producers and say, hey, Dean Spanos just told me this. We ran with it on the air. And what I realized, what I realized later on was he actually set me up. In other words, he gave me this tidbit of information, which I thought was quite a scoop. But in reality, what it did was it, it sort of made a soft landing because at that point, everybody now knew. Once he said we're now leaning towards going to L.A., the, the news was out at that point. That's a shocking story, to say the least. I mean, do you have any hard feelings today? Like, will you go to a Chargers game? Will you support the team or watch them? So um, they moved, and they've been in L.A. now. I think this is the fourth year. I swore I would never go to a game. And for the first three or four years, whatever it is, they played in this little soccer stadium, and I could never – I would never go to a game. Never. No chance, man. Uh, yes, very, very bitter. And then, then they moved into SoFi Stadium last year with no fans. And I trust, trust me when I tell you, there's nothing like this on the planet. Nothing. So um, last week, my college roommate, who is the offensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns, said to me, you have to come to the game. And my children all wanted to go to the game to see their uncle. So for the first time since the Chargers moved out of San Diego, 
I went to a game. I was wearing all brown. My kids were wearing all brown. And we went and we supported the Cleveland Browns, which is great because I've been getting a lot of correspondence from fans this week saying, I love football. I love the NFL. I hate the Chargers. So I go to games and I support the opposing team, which I think is really funny. Um, my point is I will never give that ownership group any of my money. I would never buy tickets. I would never, I would never pay for parking. It actually killed me last week when I had to buy hot dogs and sodas and beers and stuff because I knew that they, that was giving them money. But I'm still bitter. Um, and it's mostly because, look, life goes on, you know. And, and truth of the matter is, is if you love NFL football and you live in San Diego, you can drive 100 miles and get to an NFL football game. No different than if you have to go to a Staples Center game with the Lakers or, the, or you know, if you want to go see hockey. If you want these things, you have to leave San Diego and go to L.A. other than Major League Baseball. But I know that the ownership of the Chargers didn't really, really make the effort to stay in San Diego. I know that they wanted out of San Diego. I know they wanted the big money of LA and they are the luckiest ownership group in sports because Stan Kroenke and the Rams built a $5 billion super stadium and the Chargers get to use it. And on game days, you'd think it's Hollywood. I mean, they went from small town San Diego Chargers to the Hollywood Chargers on game days. And uh, for those of us that know the story intimately, it, it definitely still makes us upset. <laughs> but I will tell you this. There are a lot of San Diegans who, because the team is winning and because they have exciting players, they just couldn't help themselves. I was at the game on Sunday. I'm standing in line at a concession stand. These two lovely people come over to me. They're both wearing Justin Herbert jerseys. And they come up to me and they fist bump me. And they say, hey, um, so uh, you're here. And I'm like, yeah, wearing Browns colors. And they're like, dude, we hated the Chargers from the day they left. But because they're good and they got an exciting quarterback, we couldn't help ourselves. So we're back. And I said, look, man, we can still be friends. You support the team. I support the opposing teams. And, uh, and let's all just love football and sports together. What do you think of Justin Herbert? He's a great player. I mean, he is a great player, which, you know, it gets you back to last year when you think about it. The Chargers had a coaching staff that had this young up and coming superstar and they were they were playing another guy who is a career backup quarterback until the medical staff messed him up by giving him a shot to his lung and they punctured it. Uh, and that's how Justin Herbert's career started. It's kind of like Tom Brady. You know, there would there might not be Tom Brady if Drew Bledsoe didn't get blasted on the sideline against the Jets. There, we might not know right now how good Justin Herbert is if it wasn't for the Charger medical staff messing up Tyrod Taylor last year. Even as someone who doesn't support the team, I can look at this team and look at this quarterback and know this is a really good player. Really good. Scott Kaplan here on Sports Talk Chicago. Scott, what's your take on Justin Fields here in Chicago? I like Justin Fields, and I wish that the Bears would not have been so publicly committed to Andy Dalton. I feel like a lot of times when a coach makes such a public declaration, Andy Dalton's QB1, he's our starting quarterback no matter what. I feel like coaches put themselves into these situations where their egos get in the way. And even if they can look and go, you know what? Andy Dalton is a good, solid, middle-of-the-pack NFL quarterback. But Justin Fields has a skill set that can make him an upper echelon. And when I say that, I don't, I'm not counting on him being a top-five quarterback right away, but maybe he turns into a top-10 to 12 quarterback. I can look at his skill set and say, this kid right here has an opportunity to be really good. This guy has been in the league a long time. He's solid, and we know what we can get from him. Well, when you look at Justin Fields and his skills and you look at Andy Dalton's, what is this infatuation with waiting? I know everybody wants to play the Patrick Mahomes game. It's great. And it worked perfectly for Patrick Mahomes because he had Alex Smith in front of him, who was a much better NFL quarterback than Andy Dalton. So I don't really love what the Bears did in the early part. And I think it's interesting how they had to adjust, not because of their own choice, but because of. Andy Dalton getting hurt. And that's really the problem as I understand it with the bears, which is their offensive line is so poor that most of us would have thought Justin Fields can escape the pressure. or At least he has the skills to potentially escape the pressure. Whereas Andy Dalton does not. So I like Justin Fields. Um, I don't love what the bears coaching staff has done, but I also feel like NFL coaches look at their own longevity 
and they think to themselves, well, we signed Andy Dalton to a one-year deal. We plan on using him. I'm safe for the year because everybody in the organization knows it's just a Band-Aid. And then I'll be the coach next year when we start with Justin Fields. So this year we integrate him, we teach him the offense, and next year he's ready to go, and I still have my job. And I feel like, at least from a perception standpoint, outsider looking in, I feel like that's what Matt Nagy has done. Do you think most likely Fields will come in as long as he showed that he's going to develop Matt Nagy will be safe for next year. And then next year would be the real key for him to start winning games and moving forward. Well, I would think that that's what Matt Nagy was thinking about his own, you know, uh, (laughs) self-preservation, you know, and I would think that Matt Nagy can go to management and say, Hey guys, look, you know, and I know that the reason we only gave Andy Dalton a one-year contract is because we thought that Andy Dalton would be a band-aid. And by the time we get to year two of Justin Fields, we'll make this offensive line that much better. And so we'll get Andy Dalton all beat up this year and we'll protect Justin Fields, but look at how the circumstances have dictated. Do you trust Matt Nagy himself in developing fields and developing his skill set? I'm not really convinced that Matt Nagy is the right guy. Now, Look, uh, Matt Nagy might be watching this tonight. On, he might be flipping channels, and he might be watching this. He might be, who are these guys? Who are they to question me? Uh, but the track record is the track record. You know, you've seen what the Bears have done at the quarterback position over the last two or three seasons, and it makes you think to yourself, is this the right coach to develop this player? And right now, in my opinion, outsider again, all the way out here in California, looking in at the Bears, but I talk about the Bears a lot. One of my co-hosts on my radio show is a Chicago Bears nut, and he has been pushing for Justin Fields from the preseason. And so I I guess when I really, really look at it, I, I question, is Matt Nagy really the right coach personality? Does he have the right background? Does he have the right offensive system? Is he the right guy? to take yet another first round draft choice quarterback and develop him into a premier quarterback, because that did not happen with Mitch Trubisky, obviously. What do you think of the Mitch Trubisky situation yourself? Well, first and foremost, I thought it was a poor decision to draft a guy that high with that little experience. Um, And obviously, you know, that's hindsight now, and it's easy to say now, Uh, When everybody was looking at the draft back then, they said, well, Mitchell Trubisky's got all the intangibles. He's got the height, the weight, the arm strength, the speed, et cetera, et cetera. But what he really didn't have was the body of work while at North Carolina. And so I'm not suggesting to you that only playing 12 games in college means that you cannot become an NFL quarterback. But the fact of the matter is his first year as a starter is really like his sophomore year and you're getting a sophomore quarterback in the NFL rather than a fully developed, you know, guy who's ready to go. And so, I mean, I think that was the risk in taking Trubisky. And as we know, there were other quarterbacks in that draft who the Bears passed on who have gone on to greater success. Where do you see the Bears going this year? And where do you see them going in the future long term with Matt Nagy and Justin Fields in this whole situation? Well, I mean, as far as this year is concerned, um, I don't think they're really going anywhere. Lucky for the Bears that uh, last week when they played the Raiders, let's face it, um, the Raiders had come off their first loss of the season. Let's just back up a quick second. The Raiders were 3-0. and They were the toast of the NFL, right? Everybody in the NFL thought the Raiders were for real. People were talking about Derek Carr as a possible MVP candidate. I'm like, yo, pump the brakes. It's three weeks into the season. Then they get beat by the Chargers in a game where they're getting smoked, but they make a really nice comeback. They make it exciting and interesting. Ultimately, they fall 28-14. The Raiders go home after an emotional defeat the week earlier, and then all of a sudden, this John Gruden stuff is starting to break. And that is a major distraction for this team. And so as a result, the Bears walk into town. And, you know, Khalil Mack is uh, is still remembering what happened to him with the Raiders. And luckily for the for the Bears, they've got a really good defense and they caught the Raiders at the right time. I don't really think the Bears are going anywhere this year. The future is all about building an offensive line, in my opinion, because you do have a young quarterback who's got really good skills. Scott Kaplan here on Sports Talk Chicago. Scott, what happened to the Padres? Hmm. (laughs) What happened to the Padres? Um, The Padres did what they always do. And, you know, I try to explain this to my San Diego radio listeners and my TV viewers. I'm like, listen, we all get hyped. We all get excited because the Padres, you got to understand, unlike the Cubs, 
unlike the Dodgers, the Giants, the Yankees, the Red Sox, et cetera, the Padres always sold to their fan base that they could not compete financially against the bigger and better teams in baseball. And they, they, they convinced people of that. Hey, look, the Dodgers television rights in LA are $200 million a year. I'm making up numbers and our television rights here in San Diego are only 50 million. And that disparity means we can't keep up with those guys. Well, uh, as Padres ownership was transitioning, the new owner, very wealthy guy, convinced all the other partners to put more money into the organization. They did. And they went out and spent a ton of money on players. Never did I think I'd see a day where the Padres would play, would pay somebody $30 million a year, Manny Machado, that they would give a $14 million contract or 14 year contract, 300 plus million dollars to Fernando Tatis. I never thought the Padres would ever be in that stratosphere of spending. So now um, rather than the Padres being that cute little team that just can't keep up with the Dodgers that everybody just feels sorry for. Now they're in the big leagues. They're spending with the Dodgers. And it goes to prove that you can spend all the money you want, but you cannot necessarily purely buy a championship in baseball. There's when you look at the Dodgers and the giants right now, look at how their farm systems have been built. Look at how they've infused veteran players. Look how they found guys who weren't successful in one place, but who have found more success with these teams. Um, look at the trades they made at the trade deadline. The Padres got everybody hyped before the all-star break and then completely collapsed. And by the way, John, I wasn't very surprised about it because I've seen that movie over and over again. So uh, no big shocker to me. Who was most at fault for the collapse? In my opinion, it's A.J. Preller. He's the general manager of the Padres. And, and in my opinion, he's the most uh, he's the guy to blame. And here's why. The Padres ownership has handed off this team to him. They have allowed him to do whatever he wants. He's hired three managers. And, and this is in seven years. And in particular, the last two managers were both guys who were unknown. They did not have successful major league careers as players. They didn't really have to work their way up in, in the systems. I mean, they were working in, in clubs, but they hadn't elevated. And he plucked them. And the reason he did is a variety of reasons. One, they were very inexpensive. In other words, hey, this guy is thankful to have this job. This guy will do whatever we tell him to do which is important because A.J. Preller is a guy who makes the decisions. He sets the lineup. He tells you who's playing what position, what night, who's hitting in what position because based on lefties or righties, the general manager and the analytics are making the decisions for the Padres, not a manager sitting there with his gut in, in a clubhouse. And so for me to hire the first manager that they did, Andy Green, who I'm sure you're familiar with uh, because of his work now with the Cubs, um, and then Jace Tingler, the players in the clubhouse are like, who are these guys? And there was no respect for them. And in particular this year, you know, the, the players, they felt like the manager was just in the clubhouse to be the babysitter and the spy for the front office. And that in the second half is why things really fell apart for the Padres, which is why they ultimately fired their manager. And I believe they're going to go out and hire a manager who has real experience, who manages on gut and takes in the analytics and, uh, and I think that the general manager needs to go a little more hands-off and allow a manager to be more than a babysitter. So I blame A.J. Preller, the GM. You know, it's funny because I remember when Preller was hired, all the moves were made. They brought in the Upton brothers and that whole experiment. That thing did not work at all, obviously. Mm -hmm. He gets another chance. He does all this spending, and now they're still in this position today with an under 500 record. It's pretty shocking to me that he still has a job. Me too. But here's the thing. Um, you know, front office and the ownership gives him last year – a five or six year contract extension, a promotion with a new title. And so if you fire the guy and you got to pay him several million dollars to go away, then you got to hire another guy. And they've really gone all in on his philosophy. The thing is, is that the advertisement on the Padres was not long ago. They are the team that has the best farm system. Well, that's no longer the case. They've traded a lot of those pieces away from that farm system. And the other part of it is, is that they've had top prospects that have not yet developed into major league players. So they're just prospects. And I don't care if the guy's considered number one, if you have a number one prospect and he's a pitcher and you're struggling as bad as the Padres were for pitching, particularly in the second half of the season, and you can't get your number one prospect to the major leagues. What's the issue? You know? So, so to me, that is a really uh, a big reason 
why the Padres fell completely apart. For me, I'll say this. I will not even think about the Padres until after the All-Star break next year. I will not buy the hype. I will not believe in the first half of the season until the All-Star break. The season doesn't start until after the All-Star break. What if they do bad, though, to start? Then they pick it up later. Well, if they do bad to start, well, that's what we're accustomed to. I mean, usually baseball season in San Diego is over by June, you know? Um, But it just so happens that this year, even though they were collapsing in September, they were still right there. It just so happens that St. Louis went on this crazy run and the Padres couldn't buy a win to save their lives. What need should they address this offseason? Um, for me, if I were, you know, if I were working with the Padres and they asked me that question, I'd say first and foremost, you know, just like if the Bears, the Bears, offensive line, Padres starting pitching. You know, it's you Darvish is a guy Chicago fans will know well, but he's a little bit older. Um, Blake Snell from Tampa uh, two years ago against the Dodgers in the World Series. Everybody thought this guy was the best. And he came out to San Diego and he had a good year, not a great year. Um, Joe Musgrove is a guy who's a hometown kid from San Diego. They got from Pittsburgh. He had a nice year. But after that, they've, they've got two spots. And uh, while there is, there's, there's a guy named Mike Clevenger who was with uh, Cleveland, who they got. And he just had his second Tommy John surgery, missed the entire year. So if you're relying on a Clevenger, uh, another guy they have is a guy named Denelson Lamette. He also was injured practically all season long. If you're relying on these guys, they have another guy named Chris Paddock. I'm throwing out names that chances are Chicago fans have never heard of before. But, you know, this is a guy that they thought was going to be a star a few years ago, and he's at best a number five, and really he's not a starting pitcher. So for me, I'd address at least two starting pitchers. And then I'd, I'd really, the next thing I'd have to do is I got two guys at first base and right field who are making way too much money who just don't produce. And I would be doing everything I can to try and move those two guys, Eric Hosmer and Will Myers. I'd be trying to get rid of those two guys. Scott Kaplan still with me on Sports Talk Chicago. Scott, a few more questions before we finish up. First off, Cited, how'd you start it? So Cited is a uh, debate app for sports fans. So if you love to debate sports, this is the app where you can go at it with other fans. Um, and there's actually a winner and a loser. You know, if people argue with each other on Twitter, that conversation can go on. And there's never really a winner and a loser. And sports fans are accustomed to a clock hitting triple zeros and one team wins and one team loses. And that was really the concept behind Sided is that we can all argue all day long on Twitter. And we know what a nasty environment Twitter is. But on Sided, because you're prompted with a question and then you vote, when you go in to comment, you're actually pushed into one side or the other, or maybe it's up to six sides. The point is what we have found is that people are much more respectful and it's not really intentional. It's just, it's just the way it's played out. People aren't as nasty and as mean spirited as they are on Twitter, which I find to be a bit refreshing. Uh, But how I started it really was, listen, I was in the sports radio business, still am. And I was spending all this time on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all these social media platforms. And I was spending so much time and I was not making any money. So originally I thought I'm going to get all kinds of sports radio personalities to want to use a platform where they could actually monetize all this engagement they create. Didn't exactly work out that way. Um, This is what happens when you're in a startup and you're an entrepreneur and you have to make pivots along the way. And ultimately what has happened is, is Cited has become a tool that publishers use to keep their users on site longer to create more ad revenue opportunities. And now in the world of data collection, we actually collect first party data for the publishers and that is their information. And there's a lot out there about Google and Apple and privacy controls. And so um, that's, it's really an important thing for publishers to collect as much first party data as they can. However, all of that being said, Um, There is the consumer app, which is on Apple and on Google, and you download the Cited Debates app. You can create your own content. You can ask tons of questions. You can get a lot of feedback from people. It's great for guys like you and me that are in the sports media industry, but much of the content is user generated because fans like to ask questions. Will the Bears ever win a Super Bowl? Should Justin Fields be the starting quarterback? Should the Bears fire Matt Nagy, et cetera, et cetera? Um, And people like to ask those sorts of questions. They like to receive that kind of feedback. And I'll never forget, I was once doing a a panel with a a group of of radio listeners who I was trying to convert into sighted users. And one guy said to me, he said, you know, Kaplan, he said, I have way better takes than you do. 
and I have way stronger opinions than you do. And I know more about sports than you do. He goes, but here's the deal. You have a microphone and you've got, you know, all your Twitter followers and you have a platform and I'm an Uber driver. Okay. And I said, well, great. That's why somebody like yourself can use Cited because you can build your status within a community. You can essentially become an expert in a community. So if you're a Chicago Bears fan and you're pushing a lot of Chicago Bears content, you're going to see that you're going to score a ton of points because every time you create a debate, you get points. Every time people engage in your debate, you get points. Every time you win a debate, you get more points. You shoot up that leaderboard and you start to build expertise and like I said, uh, you, you build uh, a status within the community. So it's a lot of fun for users. And, and I appreciate it. I, I, would appre- I would love to have everybody watching and listening uh, download the Cited Debates app. What's the plan for it moving forward? Well, the plan for it is to really um, be as integrated with as many publishers as we can be. Um, You go to a website, you read an article, you get down to the bottom, there's all these ads. And then finally, finally at the bottom, it's like, hey, add a comment. The beauty of Cited is this. We actually embed the Cited questions into the article. So if you see a tweet in an article and you click on that tweet, you leave and you go to Twitter and you may not come back to that article you were reading. What we do is we embed the cited question into the article. Then when people vote on it, because people are very inclined to vote on these polls, when people vote on it, a panel opens up on the side and the conversation happens right on the website. So people stay on the website longer and that's why publishers love it. So really the game plan going forward is twofold. One, to get onto as many publisher sites as we can. We've got a lot of the SB Nation sites using it off the top of my head, like Cincy Jungle, which is the Bengals fan website, Field Goals, which is the Seahawks website, and and lots of others as well. So we've been experimenting with SB Nation sites, which is going really, really well. Um, And then the second part of what we're doing is continuing to promote uh, when we have opportunities like this. So thank you to tell the fans, this is a great place to have fun, to earn points, to build status in a community, to create uh, expertise. You'd be shocked how many guys have gone from I'm blogging to now I'm a columnist at the LA Times. And when you build community and you build status within a community and you create uh, an aura of expertise, opportunities flow. So, I mean, really, I want to get as many people watching to download the Cited Debates app, to create content on Cited, to... um, and to put stuff out there for people to debate and argue, and by the way, and do it in a much more respectful way. Because listen, here's the thing. When you like somebody's comment on Cited, you give them a thumbs up. When you don't, you give them a thumbs down, you know? And, and so people don't want those thumbs down. So they, they create more thoughtful content, which is kind of cool. Scott, before we finish up today, last question. What's the funniest moment you've been a part of on air? <laughs> well, um, I, I, (laughs) this is kind of funny and embarrassing. So way back in the day, my longtime radio partner, a guy by the name of Billy Ray Smith, who was a charger linebacker for 10 years prior to that, he was an all American linebacker at Arkansas and he had a phenomenal career as a player. He was an Outland trophy finalist. He was a parade all American. He was a, a playboy all American. I mean, this guy was every all American you could be in high school and in college, and then became the fifth overall pick in the 1983 NFL draft, which was the John Elway, Dan Marino, Jim Kelly. I mean, that was the, the quarterback draft of all time. He was the fifth overall pick. So Billy Ray and I are sitting across from each other. And uh, this is early in our partnership. And we were interviewing at the time, Pete Carroll, who was the head coach at USC. And this was at the time. And um, we're in the middle of this conversation with Pete and Pete's on the phone and I'm over here and Billy Ray's over there. And all of a sudden in the middle of this interview from out of nowhere, I get sick. I mean, I get sick where like, I go, Oh my God, I don't feel good. Oh no. I'm on the air live. Pete's on the phone. All of a sudden I throw up. I mean, literally all over my computer, all over the desk. I literally throw up all over the place, right? I get up, I put my headphones on, I get up, I run to the bathroom, clean myself up, come back in with paper towels. I'm trying to clean up the desk. All this is happening. And Billy Ray's going, okay, coach. So uh, what about running back? I mean, what do you think about running back this week? You know, how's Reggie Bush going to do? I mean, it was, it was like one of the, I, I puked in the middle of the interview. 
came back. The interview was still going on. I cleaned my face up. And I, okay, coach, thanks a lot. Good luck against UCLA. We'll talk to you real soon. Take care. <laughs> Nobody knew the difference. So, of course, I came back from commercial break and aired myself out that I threw up all over the place. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> One of many embarrassing moments along the way. Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining me. Really a pleasure to have you on. Best wishes, of course, with sided with the Mightier 1090 ESPN LA, and I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Really appreciate it. I am just so sorry to everybody watching that I look like a ghost on this side of my face because the sunshine <laughs> is coming in right now here in Southern California. It's a beautiful day. I'm trying to block the sun here. I'm trying to block the sun. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk to you, man. Anytime. Thank you so much. <laughs>